Again, thank you so much and welcome. Um, welcome to our webinar series at um, the Center for Open Science. Um, today we have a great topic, demystifying the data anonymization process, myths and best practices. Um, we were joking that everyone should try to say that three times backwards. Um, <laughs> um, we are um, recording this webinar, um, so just wanted to, to let everyone know it will be made available for distribution afterwards um, for anyone who is not available um, to attend live. Uh, we also have enabled the transcription um, service um, below um, um, for those that that, that is a um, uh, support, um, and we will make that transcript available as well. Um, so just want to take a quick second um, and introduce myself. My name is Marcy Reedy. I'm a community manager here at the Center for Open Science, um, help to support initiatives around our STEM education hub um, that we have worked with through support um, from the National Science Foundations. And just to start off, I wanted to provide some additional resources and information that would be helpful to people um, as they embark on their open scholarship journey. Um, the first of which is a STEM education um, hub page. Um, and in there, it is a trove of valuable resources um, that you can go to if you are searching for training and deep dive um, supports into open scholarship. Um, there are deep dives into pre-registration, into open access, um, collection of our previous webinars, including on um, data visualization, um, supporting early career researchers and open scholarship, an overview and licensing and copyright procedures. Um, so that is a great resource um, to bookmark and go to if you're looking for information. Um, as well as I wanted to share a quick link um, to a hub we have created on the OER Commons website um, that we're calling the Open um, Scholarship Knowledge Base which is a repository of the what, when, how of open scholarship, everything that you might need to know. Um, it not only allows you to search for resources, it also allows you to add your own um, if you'd like to support co colleagues um, that are in their open science uh, journey. So we invite you to, to visit that as well and bookmark it and take advantage of the, the resources there. Um, so with those resources shared and without um, further ado, um, a couple housekeeping tips. Um, we did, it seems like the Q&A has already been found. Yay, thank you so much, Philip. Um, but we did wanna encourage everyone to take advantage of that um, and um, share questions as the webinar um, proceeds. Um, we certainly wanna make this active and engaging and responsive to the audience. Um, so we, we encourage you to take advantage of that. Um, also, we will be monitoring the attendee list, and if you see, there is a raise hand function. Um, so if you prefer to actually um, make a comment um, and for us to, to call on you, we would be happy to do that. So I will be monitoring it. Feel free to raise your hand um, if you would like some clarification or a uh, question um, about what is being presented um, at that time. And we will try to keep track of that and monitor it pretty closely. And so without further ado, um, because no one wants to hear from me, they want to hear from our guest, Dr. Uh, Michael Altman today. And we welcome him. We thank him for joining us and sharing his valuable perspective and expertise. Um, thank you so much for, for joining us, Dr. Altman. Um, Dr. Altman is a social and information scientist at MIT Center for Research in Equitable and Open Scholarship. And previously, he served as director of research for MIT Libraries and um, at the Harvard University as the associate director for the Harvard MIT Data Center. So hugely impressive background, amazing person to speak on this topic about data anonymization. And we thank you so much for joining us and, um, and invite you to take it away. Thank you, Marcy. And hello, COS community. I'm really pleased today to have an opportunity to talk about the research and practice we've been doing and to share some of it. Um, this is uh, informed both by some of our, our research with a, a number of collaborators uh, and by uh, previous work 
both as a social scientist and as a head of a social science data archive. In, in this talk, we'll reflect on the fact that there's more information from individuals that's available than ever before. And that the laws, technologies, uses are all changing rapidly. So what I hope to do here is to look at how we integrate information protection into the research life cycle and deal with those ethical, legal, statistical, and methodological considerations. And particularly to talk about what are the needs for information protection to help characterize key concepts and to identify some next steps for you. So before we go further, there are a few caveats for this talk. This work represents my own perspective. It's not MIT, not our funders, not the library. Further, we're making predictions about where information and privacy and anonymization is going to go. That's tough to make, especially when you're talking about the future. So to summarize, if there's anything that's wrong in this presentation, it's entirely my fault. Uh, and if there's anything that you like, it wouldn't have been possible without uh, all, uh, many, many collaborators, some of whom I'll cite, the MIT library for hosting earlier research uh, and some of our past funders for supporting many research projects in this area. And of course, Senos Gigantum Humoris Incidentis, the project builds upon scholarship and many others, only a few of whom could be directly referenced in this, this presentation. So one of the facts of research now and of the world is that personal information is everywhere, including where it isn't wanted. Uh, and that includes information about what we do, what we say, what we think, where we go, history, health, property. All of this information is uh, much more commonly observed, recorded, shared. It's the subject of research, it's the subject of commerce. And a lot of this is voluntary. Uh, this is a chart of the growth of monthly active users in Facebook in the millions. So there are uh, 3 billion active users on, uh, monthly active users on Facebook. Seems like a lot. Um, sharing all sorts of information uh, about themselves, their friends, their activities. Now, this is not really consented information, but even within this framework of consent, there are externalities, such as my sharing something that might contain information about you, picture perhaps with you in it. There are network effects. Facebook is really the, the only game in town for social information sharing of this sort because the value of the network grows with the number of people in it and they've got 4 billion people. And then asymmetric information because Facebook knows a lot more about how they can use your information and what the threats to you are than when you, than you do when you, you post a photo or send a message. So even voluntary information that is consented um, may not be done so under sort of full, informed, reflective, entirely uncoerced consent. Sometimes information um, has consequences that, uh, that the availability of information has consequences that are entirely unexpected. This is a, one example, it's a mudshot database. Um, and it illustrates that nominally public information can become universally discoverable rapidly. And actually about 10 years ago, uh, especially in the US, a number of county records office started putting uh, arrest records on the internet, part of transparency. Now these were nominally public. You had a right to see them as public records, but it usually involved going down to the county court office during you know, a, a, a specified window of time when they were open and pay, asking to look at a particular person and paying for the copying fees. Having these all just heaved onto the internet had some consequences. 
made them discoverable, which created new opportunities for aggregation, analysis, and use. At inspires new business models, such as creating a database of mugshots so that you might uh, maybe support criminal search or maybe uh, because you don't want to be in a database of mugshots and you'll pay to have your uh, mugshot removed. So an intentional misuse can arise uh, as well as unintentional misuses. In order to, for you to discover that you're in this database of mugshots, well, you have to find it. How do we find people? Find out, out this information typically through Google. So there were uh, these, these mugshot databases bought uh, last name records, uh, last name advertisements, and said when somebody searches on a common last name, put an, up an ad so that they'll know that we have our, their mugshot up and they'll pay us to take it off. Uh, but people tend to click on these ads more frequently when they see black first names than white first names. Um, it's based on work by Latonya Sweeney. Um, and so what ended up happening was that the ads, the ad algorithm adjusted to only show ads for these databases when there was a combination of a uh, white first, a white, black first name and a, and a last name, even though the, the mugshot database people did not have any intention to discriminate by race. And legislation then comes around um, works at the edges, changes things, but you will still see, a, you will still see um, advertisements for criminal records on Google, though the racial bias is now, in that particular case, is now more controlled. Hooray. There have been a lot of other data protection issues in the headlines from international disputes to breaches in unexpected breaches in anonymity to claims about group control over information, controversies over consent, problems with hacking and identity theft. And my favorite, that's my second favorite, that uh, reading privacy policies will take you 76 days uh, of your life. So there's another aspect of consent. Uh, although technically you've consented to all of the web privacy policies and click-throughs, you've never read them. Information, uh, information threats are changing in a, in a variety of ways in the current environment. Information travels wider and faster. Cyber attacks are increasingly common. Common platforms for information collection, storage, et cetera, expose information in new ways. And privacy leakage accumulates, even when people use disclosure control methods. One, uh, one aspect of this that is becoming increasingly important is how aggregate information can reveal things about us. So if we think about how unique am I as an individual, if you know there's someone whose birthday is the 31st, um, whose zip code is 02145, whose gender is male, have you identified them? Well, pretty close. There's, there may be two people there with those sets of attributes. So if those attributes are public, even though we have not used a name, we've accumulated enough aggregate information to learn something about them. For example, that they're in this data collection. And it's not just numbers and databases that reveal this. This is a statistical graphics of disease incidences um, and it turns out that given the, and this is simulated, but this is from a study that looked at uh, graphics like this, and you can look at a, a disease incident chart and given the criteria for having had that disease, learn a lot about in, whether particularly individuals are likely to have 
have a disease in that area. Even though there's not, uh, you know, the streets aren't labeled, you can match it to a map, et cetera. So regardless of the form of the information, whether it's a map or a picture or a story, we can accumulate privacy losses and, and learn things about people in aggregate. So there are specific challenges of anonymity, and that's where we're going to focus on for the most part here. One is around the environment, the, the rapid change in how much data is collected, how fast dissemination and broadly dissemination occurs. Uh, this doesn't fundamentally change the problem, but it brings some, um, some fundamental constraints into sort of a harsh light. And one is that anonymity isn't about naming. It's not really about finding Micah Altman in the data set. It's about learning. If you can, if you don't know, you didn't learn my name from the data set or learn that I was record 236, but you did learn that I was in the study. Um, and the study is of ex-criminals, you've learned something about me. Or maybe you've only learned it, maybe you only learned that I'm probably there. This accumulation of learning, however, can create the sorts of harm that we typically think of anonymization is preventing. So anonymization is really about learning about individuals, not about acquiring specifically their names and identity, et cetera. We've also learned that you know, the, although perfect privacy is possible, it involves throwing away all the data. So if we, we want to have useful information, we can't have perfect privacy. We will always learn at least a little bit about people who participated in the data, you know, in the computation. And what we need to do is to minimize that amount for the value of what we're learning. And we have, but even when we minimize this, privacy losses add up. And so we have to manage those losses cumulatively and conscientiously. So as researchers, we're responsible for uh, information privacy and all of the, all the consequences of sharing information, at least ethically. Many countries recognize information privacy and some recognize data protection as a universal human right. Um, this involves not only necessarily anonymity, but also characteristics of like intrusion into, into, your, into your life. Um, dignity, reputation, and control over your information. And researchers have ethical responsibilities in general. But the point of research is, is informational. It is to, to gather information and able in order to learn. And so when we are doing research we, on human subjects, on humans, we have to be concerned about the information we gather. That's a central part of what we're doing. We tend to gather that information. We're going to benefit from it and it should be, protecting it should be a core concern. People participate in research because they view it as a public good. And we have an ethical responsibility both to protect their privacy and to make sure the benefits of the, the research um, compensate for the, 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 the inevitable privacy loss, even when we when minimize it, that will be involved in, in conducting research. Furthermore, there are legal risks and requirements. And I assert that researchers should treat the law as a supplement to ethical responsibilities. They are, you need to comply with the law. It is part of being ethical. It is not um, not the beginning or end of ethical responsibilities. To do this, you'll need to incorporate data security and privacy planning during your research design, both to minimize the, the legal risks to you and your institution and the ethical risks to 
your institution and data subject. Now, there are many different laws. Um, I am not a lawyer. This is not legal advice. Um, and they place different sort of requirements. I'll talk about some of the privacy concepts underneath the law and hope that this presentation will help you identify some possible legal issues. But it is not a substitute for, for legal advice. And the, the requirements and triggers for these requirements and even the, the definition of the same word, say anonymate, anonymity, varies from law to law. So in summary, there's a responsibility to understand individual rights and interests and anticipate harms that may result from participation in your research. And you can address this through research design, data management planning, selection and use of protections. And we'll focus in the rest of this talk on some of the key concepts to identify. And yes, we will have a uh, slides after the, will be disseminated along with the, um, the recording, thanks. And we'll address this through uh, planning informational controls throughout the life cycle. So let's dive into some key concepts. And actually, key concepts in this area derive from three domains. Uh, and these domains have grown organically. So the separation is not always that clean. Uh, but it's useful to keep track of whether you're using a particular word or concept in one domain or another, even, even when the same word may be, you know, may be involved multiple. So at core, there are a number of policy concepts, one of which I'll call informational harms and benefits. General sense of what are, what are the overall goods and bads that come to individuals in society from, um, from a particular activity and privacy and informational rights that we are protecting. And those are uh, in, in essence policy concepts that are implemented through technology and through the law. On the technical side, there are concepts of information security, anonymization and utility and Sometimes, again, these words are used in other domains, but I'm going to use them primarily as technical. On the legal side, there are concepts of things like de-identification, scope of authority, personally identifiable information, sensitivity, none of which are strictly defined in terms of the technical the statistics of, or um, uh, computer security definitions of privacy. but um, but are regulated by law. So let's dive into a few of these. So informational harm, informational harms occur when others use, or from research, when others use research results or data, learn something and then violate the rights of others or negatively affect social welfare. Uh, and this is a very broad definition. Um, and anonymity, just a can't, anonymity doesn't take care of all of these. But some examples of these harms are linking a de-identified health record to an individual, find a data set you managed, managed to pin it to Micah Altman, I am denied employment, or I lose my employment because it's discovered I have this condition. So that's an anonymity harm. Um, perhaps you do a, a, a statistical analysis on some aggregate data tables. And you figure out that, you know, a particular household in this zip, it's only, you know, several households in, in, in a particular zip code, and all of them participated in the study. And so you know that, you know, those, how all households of interest in that area participated in the study of sex offenders. Um, so you haven't really identified a particular person, but you know they're in there and you've learned something about them. Um, that could be 
considered anonymity, though maybe not individual. Um, another is you use biosamples collected for analysis of diabetes. And, uh, and then you extend that to estimate inbreeding among indigenous people, and that contributed to stereotype or was alleged to contribute to stereotyping and stigma. We're farther away from anonymization here. Um, you, this could have happened whether you, if you had completely de-identified the data. So anonymization would not be a, a protection against this, though we might agree that it's an informational harm. Uh, second, what, another is uh, analysis of exercise data shows what popular running paths exist. And it also shows you where, where classified military bases are. This happened um, with the Strava application. Uh, again, probably not anonymization, at least not in the way that it's typically thought of. Or you build really good machine learning models, you train them on user data, you develop something profitable and you don't share the results. Well, potentially you know, an economic uh, misappropriation, but not anonymization. Information privacy, more broadly, is about the interests that individuals and groups have in controlling information about or from them. Let's, who, who might be harmed from an information release? Uh, we could talk about harms that come, any of these harms coming to the data subject to not necessarily the result of the data subject, but to a vulnerable group. Um, for example, the um, harm of stereotyping from using the diabetes data for inbreeding arguably is and does not rest on a particular individual as much as it rests on a group. and doesn't rely on the participation of specific individuals so much as it relies on this participation of the group. We also may care about harm to institution, and often that's where legal and uh, institutional uh, authorities are, are focused, as well as on data subjects. And there are, and, and we have a uh, obligation to society, um, individual protection of information may still lead to unwanted, um, Un unwanted social harms, surveillance or dual use of data or all sorts of things. Um, but for this, we're focusing on, for, for the concept of anonymity really focuses on the data subject. Although informational harms more broadly can involve any, uh, can involve those other actors, anonymity harms are in reference to the data subject, research subject. Now let's dive into some technical concepts. Information security is about the control and protection against unauthorized access, use, disclosure, disruption, modification. Someone hacks into your castle and steals all your records. That is an information security violation. Um, if they uh, if they hack into and it is also probably a privacy violation because it involves the control and protection over the extent and circumstances of collection, sharing, and use. Someone breaks into your information castle and burns it all down. It's a security violation, but it's not a privacy violation. And anonymity is a subcase and a more technically well-defined subcase of privacy, which is focused on what others can learn about participants in the data as a result of their of the data collection processing analysis if someone learns something about you because you participated in the data they learned that you've got uh, you're likely to have lung cancer because you were in the data and they looked at the data and they found some 
um, some heightened area and your zip code traced it to your household, um, that's anonymity. Uh, however, if they learn something, if they learn that you're uh, more likely to have lung cancer, not, not as a result of your participation. For example, maybe the study just shows that people who um, have your profession are more likely to have lung cancer. They might have learned that whether or not you participated. That's not anonymity. So all useful computations provide some ability to learn about the individuals measured in the data from which the computations were made. We say anonymization fails when others learn more than a minimal amount because the person was involved in the data. So if I learn more, if, if I learned that you're more likely to have lung cancer and I deny you insurance because your risk of lung cancer in my eyes has gone up 20% because, because you were part of that data process and I would not have learned it if we had randomly sampled a bunch of other people and done the same thing, then you violated my privacy. Ah, that's a good question. So there's a question about how you distinguish the type of knowledge that is likely to be gained without participating in research versus when you participate. Um, and one of the answers is, uh, is the privacy concept you're using and we'll go into the one of the that's that's distinguishing it between these two things is a uh is at the core of the concept of differential privacy which i'll i'll talk about a little bit in this so in response to this question um there are different sort of stages of thinking about identifiability um in, in the mid 60s and 70s or so, the, the state of the art was where is Waldo? We thought about anonymization and identifiability as being able to link to a, personal, a particular person in the database. If I can match you to record 17238 in the database, a broken bit of privacy. Now, of course, that's generally true if I can match your record to a specific database and if that database has useful information that I didn't know of before. But it turns out that although that's a useful attack method, you know, that, that is not a, a, a necessary condition for, for definition of privacy. A second uh, sort of 1990s or so concept is like indistinguishability. Maybe if, we, if there's a large enough group of people that you can't tell something about, then that's privacy. Well, you know, and the idea was that, you know, the, the realization that you, even when we didn't link you to record 748, the fact that we learned that you were in the data set and you were one of 30 people who had committed, um, who, it, who was in the subset of data who had committed uh, horrendous crimes meant that we learned something interesting about you. Um, but it turns out that sort of like thinking about the crowd of people to which you are identical is still not a great like core definition of privacy. Uh, and the, the most sophisticated, the most modern definition of privacy, which is where uh, differential privacy and its variants are focused, are on limiting what adversaries can learn. And you can do this very formally in a statistical encrypt with statistical and cryptographic analysis. And it's actually possible to prove that for some particular data, uh, data computation processes, that you can limit the amount that an individual contributes to the result. So the sensitivity of, of the answer, say the, um, mean income of that district it can all if that can be guaranteed not to be affected by any individual by too much then it's impossible and you can say that if you just publish these summary statistics you can limit the uh, statistically how much people can learn across all possible background knowledges and distribution so basically if i you know 
if I uh, thought you had a 50% chance of being a criminal, and I look at the data, you can guarantee that my probability over you being a criminal will not change by more than 0.05%. Of course, there's a trade-off between information utility and privacy. Perfectly anonymous data is perfectly useless data. And there's no, while there is a, a very formal way of describing the information privacy that you lose in terms of the um, posterior log odds of how, you know, how much more you're changing the distribution of belief over somebody's properties. There's no single definition of utility. You can talk about mean square error, you can measure these trade-offs, but this will vary from case to case. And so privacy protections always balance usefulness and privacy. There's also a number of legal concepts. And these some of these sound like technical and um, policy concepts, but it's really important to distinguish them. Um, because legal concepts um, are sometimes at odd with the, the technical definitions. So sensitivity are conditions under which the law expects some higher expectation of harm and usually requires additional scrutiny or protection. For example, uh, the uh, federal law may declare that data about um, criminal history is more sensitive. So when you ask questions and you collect measures in that space, there are more required protections. You may, you may expect more risk and so you may need more controls. Scope of authority talks about the conditions under which information is regulated by specific law. And this is typically related to the properties of the data subject, the data collector, the data user, for example, are you, a, if I'm uh, a resident of Massachusetts and the data collector is a organization doing business in that Massachusetts, then they're subject to the um, Massachusetts personal information protective, protection law. Otherwise, the information doesn't come under the scope of the law. And finally, the law generally uh, has some concepts around identifiability, often referred to as de-identification. This is, these specify the conditions under which the law considers outputs to be anonymous in scare quotes. And it often, no, not always, it implies under that law that the laws, that the, the outputs are not subject to any further regulatory requirements. Often this is based on some complementary definition of PII or personally identifiable information say a list of attributes that if you get rid of them, it'll be anonymous. And this is where the tension between legal concepts and technical concepts um, are most important currently. Because uh, technically, uh, um, what you can learn is not, you know, is not dependent on specific attributes. You can learn you can learn things from any attribute and you have to look at the combination of, of information and the computations in order to understand learnability. You cannot simply say, if you take out the name, the first name, as you can in the Massachusetts law, you take out the first name and everything is okay, it's anonymous. Um, doesn't work like that in statistics, so it may work like that in law. And there's also an, you, uh, sometimes an underlying legal assumption that anonymization is equivalent with zero risk, which is also not true. That's a matter of uh, technical reality, not legal reality. So for example, FERPA, which is uh, the, the federal, US federal law protecting education data, defines identifiability in terms of a direct list of PII, so specific attributes like name that, if they're present, imply that it's identifiable. And then an, a notion of linkage, that there's some indirect information that together could, could also identify a person, though it doesn't, it doesn't specifically tell you how to tell when something is linked or not. 
HIPAA, but to be uh, to be de-identified, it has to both eliminate PII and not be directly limited, linked. HIPAA, it's an either or. You can eliminate 18 identifiers in a list, or you can verify that it's you can't link it through a quote statistician, which I think is a GS13 statistician, which means you've got like some number, you have a degree, undergraduate degree, and some number of credit hours in statistics. Um, so, and the common rule, which is um, where a lot of our research and where our IRBs come from, research is governed and our IRBs come from, uh, in the US, um, has a standard read, readily identifiable. They also have concepts of sensitivity. FERPA, anything that is not a defined as a directory information, directory information is okay. It's not sensitive, so there's no harm, even if it's identifiable. Anything else is sensitive. HIPAA, it's going to be medical information. And the common rule depends on the harm that you'd expect from the information how sensitive it is. And then the scope, they apply, FERPA applies to data collected by institutions receiving federal educational funding, HIPAA to data collected by institutions designated as health providers, covered entities, and the common rule to data collected by institutions re receiving federal research funding. So if you have a private company and you collect data to do research, you're not covered by any of these, and you have no legal responsibilities under any of these laws. So let's talk about the processes of anonymization. And protection should be viewed as a process. Effective data protection is a result of an effective process. It's not strictly the property of a data output. You can't, if we look at the number 721071, Four, 426. Is that like the average wealth of the zip code in which Bill Gates lives? Is, is that a, a privacy violation? Is, if it is, um, it is impossible to know given that number. And in fact, even if you had an entire data set, just looking at that data set, you cannot say this is, uh, this is de-identified in a technical sense or this is like statistical average in a technical sense. For both of these things, you need to understand the process that generated the outputs. And more generally, we can think about data protection in every life cycle stage from collection through post-processing. And that number is a social security number, by the way, um, but uh, the person is, not covered by law, so we're good. There are different opportunities to protect at different parts of the research life cycle, uh, including at the research design stage, the research implementation stage, the research analysis stage, and the post-analysis stage. These include things like evaluating privacy and security of measurement and data collection, how you store data, what you do for disclosure limitation, and the auditing, adverse event monitoring, data destruction that you do afterwards. We're going to focus, although these all have some importance for the overall data protection information harm, we're gonna focus on the disclosure for anonymization. Um, you can think about not only the, the stage, but the level of harm in terms of a continuum from sort of minimal risk, and this is just a, a guide for thinking, it is not a official uh, legal standard, to grave risk of harm should that data be, be linked to a person, learned about a person and um, found by an adversary. So maybe if someone knows my favorite flavor of ice cream, even if it's fine, no, even if they, they figure out that mine is fudge ripple, nothing bad will happen. But if they know that I am a sex offender, it could be a grave risk to me. So the consequences of breaching anonymity will vary. And so how we 
um, protect the data will be sort of a, will, will be a factor of both how identifiable the data is, what the risk of learning about individuals from that data is, and the harm, the sensitivity of that data. That and so for you know either harmless data, even if it's identifiable or really you know formally protected. Data, um, strongly anonymous data, we might choose to release it without any any other protections. Um, but if something is either less well protected, maybe because there are no formal methods that you can use for that particular analysis, or has a higher risk of harm, you might want to combine things like uh, disclosures, statistical disclosure control with uh, restrictions on use, secure data enclaves, legal agreements, auditing, and other sorts of controls. And generally, there will be multiple, you want to plan for multiple ways of getting at the data for tiered access. So there will be some outputs that either because of their anonymity or lack of sensitivity, you can give, you can make available for the public, some which you may need to have gate and some which are are necessary to support particular uses especially like uh, cutting edge research uses but that you need many levels of protection for and simply like trying to anonymize the data and disseminate it will not be sufficient for those types of research well let's think let's drill in this end part into disclosure limitation for data publishing this is a sort of, uh, you can think of it mechanistically as you apply a set of transformations at a particular stage to, um, to execute a privacy goal and it results in some output. So that's a sort of mechanical, mechanical timeline view of it. Um, the important part here is really the privacy concept. Um, because it's the privacy concept like differential privacy that dictates how protective the result's gonna be, regardless of the transformation, the processing stage, or, or the particular output. It's this the privacy concept that, that's creating the protection guarantee. But we'll look at some example transformation. So one is like consent, we just release it. Redaction. Domain generalization, we limit the, the values of the pixels. We've got synthetic data. You might still be able to recognize me. Um, aggregation, we aggregated lots of pixels. Noise, these are all transformations that are used in, uh, commonly used in all sorts of different disclosure control processes. Um, and just, and this is a sort of different category. This is an example of conceptually of using differential privacy as a solution concept, right? Here, it's not just that we're using noise, but that we have a idea of using noise to produce an aggregate result where the input doesn't affect the output more than, it. so this is not my face blurred, it is the average face. So that's where, where this, uh, you know, this idea of formal protection comes in is that you are, you are reporting results, averages, model results, et cetera, and the, per, the input from a particular person does not affect the output too much. Of course, this is perfect privacy where we remove everything. Here's an example of a particular data set with some nastiness in it. And here we've removed some fields, aggregated, generalized others, suppressed others, and averaged others. So this is a, a result of applying aggregation, suppression, and generalization. So we considered favorite ice cream flavor to be non-sensitive, so we didn't do anything to that. Hopefully nobody, nobody figures out that I like crunchy frog as a flavor and matches me somewhere else. So all of these transformations reduce utility. 
there's a tension between maximizing the breadth of future uses and minimizing risk for targeted uses. So if you know exactly what you want, you can focus on a method that protects privacy for that particular use. If you're trying to create a general uh, reusable synthetic data set, it's not going to be as useful for every specific use. And if you don't say how you anonymized it and you don't provide the measures of the uncertainty you introduced, you're going to get biased analyses. This is true no matter what method you use, and it's always been true, but it's, it's becoming more, um, more obvious, and the debate over the, the census result highlights this. But very quickly, just some next steps are to articulate privacy principles, identify the legal institutional requirements, enumerate informational harms that are part of the research, develop a principled lifecycle data protection plan, and select and apply privacy protection tools. And really, this set of slides is just is, is a set of links for useful resources to get you to the next step. So articulating the subject rights, there are resources for that, but you know, the data protection is to protect subjects. You should consider and articulate at your project what who you're protecting and from what. Data protection doesn't involve just disclosure control at the end, but is part of a whole life cycle. And that involves both uh, design principles for how, what you are protecting and what you are enabling, and how you're, how you're measuring both. For legal and institutional requirements, you're gonna need to identify your institutional policies, national law, if you're in member states, there are resources for each of these. Informational harms, generally a qualitative process. The information landscape is large and rapidly evolving. And we can enumerate categories of harm, but understanding what particular risks are most important to your subjects and your research is a qualitative analysis that you'll need to conduct and revisit. Then designing the lifecycle data protection process, including particular, um, particular information controls and particular disclosure control methods. And so a general, you know, a general warning here, this is an area where the state of the art has substantially outrun the state of the practice and to some extent the law. You know, the textbooks are outdated. They're not, they, they cover the 70s and 90s methods fairly well, but not methods introduced uh, and the new privacy enhancing technologies and formal methods as well. So there's some introductions. Um, and the, the software, uh, the shrink wrap software handles, again, the 70s and 90s era methods. And this is fairly a fairly comprehensive list of the shrink wrap software available, by the way. Um, um, but for things like um, differential privacy that goes beyond, you know, using differential privacy to compute means of tables or things like that, to um, or secure multi-party computation or other privacy enhancing, you know, more advanced privacy enhancing technologies, you'll need to get into development libraries and the like. Um, and it is, you know, the, I guess the good news is that it is, it is generally possible to, um, to get to legal compliance with the, the set, you know, for now with the 70s and 90s methods. But uh, that's not future proofing you for, for, for risks that can, even legal risks that could hit you or uh, and is not uh, not protecting against all the possible risks of the subjects. You can find more information about how to contact me and some working papers on my website. And uh, I've seen a number of questions, you know, we've, we've had a number of questions in the chat and we can uh, open up for more questions now.
Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Altman. We do have a number of interesting questions, very thought-provoking. Um, one I was really interested in from Ryan says um, that he uses data from continuous glucose monitors, which collect glu glucose levels every five minutes. What are your thoughts on entering a bit of non-significant error to throw the folks trying to link data off the trail? <laughs> um, so, so there, you know, there's a um, a deep insight into that, and that, that's both like a that's a great idea and a not great idea at the same time. So noise is a fundamental, introducing noise is a fundamental tool for um, a fundamental transformation method that can be used in data protection. Um, however, the introduction of noise has to be, has to be engineered so that it, uh, it is known to fit a particular privacy solution concept. Um, it is easy to inject noise in a way that um, makes it really easy to uh, compute, like uh, to recover um, information about the individual or subgroup. For example, um, we could we could in, if we have a a um, suppose that glucose monitor had a measure of your location. I know this is. A strange thing to have, but suppose it just recorded the location stamp where you were, and you noise that. In fact, you only recorded the day, and the uh, and day plus or minus a week, you know, the date plus or minus a week, and the the um, location plus or minus a hundred miles. If we had a sequence of five or ten of those, that would be a over you know over a week or a month that would create a unique fingerprint that we can match to any other database. So if we could observe that person that with, even with that level of noise somewhere else, we can match them and suddenly start. So, so you ha the noise has to be governed by a higher level algorithm that is engineered to provide privacy. Another good question we had was how the anonymization process would work with a study involving interviews. Um, what if the participants' answers could be identifying? Well, um, yeah, generally that's um, that's that's a a uh, there's a life cycle life life cycle consideration when we think about um, what are we trying to learn and what are the outputs? There are a number of risks from like collecting survey information. One is that, you know, the first is that people might be observed while they are being interviewed, right? So whether or not the you know, answers are identifying, then there's that information, the, the, uh, the raw data might have identifying information either uh, directly or indirectly. Um, the platform on which it is used like if you go through SurveyMonkey, they may be collecting IP addresses, so that could that could be identifying. So you have you have to look at the whole process of how are the inputs related to your outputs. What are you releasing in terms of your um, final final analysis, data products, publications, etc. And do you have a process that limits what people can learn from that? And that might you know if it were people's, you know, if you, if you needed open-ended answers, it might involve coding those answers and releasing the topics. There, even even if, if you redact information from answers, um, if the answers are long enough, they can be uh, analyzed stylometrically. So we, you know, from blog posts, we can tell who wrote it by writing style. Um, so, so you have to think of it as, a, as an overall life cycle and, uh, and sort of balance the goals of protection against what you're, what you're releasing. Yeah. Um, type, could you, uh, if there's no other questions, could you please elaborate on the idea of a privacy concept that one could apply to research data and the difference between the privacy concepts you introduced? Yeah, so, um, I think the core privacy concept that to, to focus uh, that we focused on right now is anonymity, which is um, 
technically defined in, in a modern framework as what you can learn about an individual because of their participation, right? Um, that, that is a different privacy concept from say a legal, legal concept. Can I, can I prove that you are a record number of 33? Um, or um, it is also a, um, a different privacy concept than say group privacy concept. You may, you know, you may sample from uh, Ashkenazi Jews uh, like me, and um, you may learn about breast cancer mutation in them. Um, it doesn't violate my individual privacy. So it is in that sense individually anonymous. But it may be that you are interested in group information or you may have you may have a privacy concept that involves you know, uh, control over data purpose. Maybe you've anonymized the data and nobody knows it's me, but I didn't authorize you to use it for um, for machine learning and building profitable models, or for research into um, genealogy rather than medicine. So there there are different sorts of uh, end goals that you may be trying to maximize with those different sorts of, of modifications to the data and protections in the life cycle. Ooh, nice. uh, what is a, thanks, uh, what is a basic or first step towards anonymization is to be taken in the case, I wish to public a data set supplementary to a scientific publication that contains patient data. Um, for that, I would refer back to uh, the the two um, the two anonymization textbooks. I think are uh, particularly the the first textbook link sort of provides us with basic. How can we um, how could we 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 do some basic checks to make sure that they're not do no obvious individual identifiers that. Um, that some of the standard attacks to link can't work. Um, it's, it's still, there are other things that will be necessary to provide sort of form, more formal protection, but that's a, that's a good step. Big step indeed. <laughs> well, with that, um, we are at 3.03, so we have reached time. I know we could go on forever with questions. It's such a rich, rich topic. Um, and um, we will follow up, have contact information. So please, um, attendees, feel free to reach back out to us with other questions and follow up. Um, we hope to continue this conversation. Um, it's a start, um, certainly um, a progress. We're going to continue to work on. Um, but I just wanted to take this, this time to, again, thank you, Dr. Altman, so much for joining us. Um, we really appreciate you leading this discussion and, and sharing um, all of your expertise. Well, this is a you know this is a topic that I find very interesting, and I think is is really important to researchers and research subjects. So I thank everyone for you know having ha paying some attention to it and and diving into the details with me. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you everyone. Have a great day. <laughs>